Okay, everybody, so it's quarter to 11, so I suggest we start. Can you hear me? So, yes? Yeah, no problem. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> so this session brings together a number of projects around nutrient um, stewardship, some around recycling, some around management, some around monitoring. It's one of the smaller sessions in terms of numbers of projects, which means that hopefully we will actually have some time for discussion. Um, so the aim is to go through the, the presentations of the projects and then exchange about what we see as outstanding needs for research into nutrients in coming years. So I'd like to start with the first project, which is Sandra Pokain from the Joint Research Center. Great, we can see your slides, so go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I will, do you hear me? Yes? Okay. I will briefly tell you about this uh, work, which is done under the working group ECOSTAT in the Water Thermal Directive Implementation Process. So as we all know, eutrophication is still the major problem in European lakes and rivers and coastal waters. And water framework directive aims to reach good status in all these waters. An assessment is based on ecological assessment systems, which includes biological quality elements, including also eutrophication sensitive elements like phytoplankton, macrophytes, and so on. And these assessment systems are intercalibrated among member states. But important part in this assessment is also the supporting quality elements, which includes also nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen. And these boundaries, thresholds, what is good status and what is not good status, should be set by member states and should support good status as set by biological quality elements. Next slide, please. And recently what we have done, we have done a huge work. We have compiled member state nutrient boundaries, actual phosphorus and nitrogen concentrations, which delineate good status and we compared it. And this is for rivers and lakes. It's slightly outdated, but you can see that the differences are really huge. There are phosphorus boundaries. This is good moderate phosphorus boundaries for rivers and lakes. They can range from uh, less than 10 micrograms per liter to more than 300 and 500. And there are two major reasons for these differences. One is absolutely legitimate, it's typology. We have different water, lake and river types. We have different regions. So of course, these phosphorus thresholds, which means also phosphorus targets for different water bodies are different and they should be different. But another, another reason is approach. These thresholds have been set using different approaches. And in, in some cases, these approaches cannot be based on ecology, it's based on expert, expert judgment or, in, or, or, or other, other approaches. So if they, they cannot really maybe be useful to reach good status. And we have also, this is a paper which describes more in detail these thresholds and approaches, how they have been set. Next slide, please. So, so our work, which was done under working group ECOSTAT, we have derived, we have derived best practice guide, which says, and also toolkit, how to derive nutrient boundaries. And what is inside this guide? So this guide provides approaches, methodologies, how to set nutrient boundaries, including phosphorus boundaries, which would set, which would support good ecological status, which means which pre prevent eutrophication. And which is also very important, we already have include, included ranges of phosphorus and nitrogen, most probable thresholds for broad, broad types. And also it includes yeah, statistical approaches and user-friendly toolkit. And we, we have, you can find also here several papers where we have used this, these approaches to set nutrient boundaries for lakes, for rivers, and for coastal and transitional waters. But this work is going on. And what is important thing, what is your, what is the takeaway message is that we have to work on establishing nutrient thresholds for lakes and rivers and coastal waters in Europe, because a lot of work has been done but still we see that, that uh, these uh, thresholds or targets in many cases are not so clear where they should be. And it's very important. Thanks. Thank you, 
Sandra, that would be very interesting. I think we will we will come back to it because we talked in the plenary about uptake of research products results. And of course, you are in a very specific position because you are part of the European Commission. So it'd be interesting to talk with you about how you see the uptake of this research into policy. <laughs> um, for the moment, we'll move on and then we'll come back to questions um, in a moment. So the next presentation is Kasper Reitzel for the RECAP project. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's here. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kasper Reitzel and I'm from uh, the University of uh, Southern Denmark and I'm the coordinator of this new European project called RECAP. This is uh, Marie Curie, uh, Horizon 2020 Action. It's a so-called innovative training network. Uh, and these networks aim to, to train uh, a cohort of up to 15 PhD students on a, on a specific topic. And here in RECAP, we will focus on, on the Global Phosphorus Challenge, uh, and we will uh, provide interdisciplinary training of 15 PhD students, and we will try to, to bridge the major sectors of agriculture, waste, and, and environment. Uh, please, the next one. Yeah. And we will uh, do this by, by forming this, this network. We have 23 partners uh, uh, at the moment, uh, a nice mixture of uh, both academic and industrial partners spanning 10 countries, nine European and, and one from Australia. And uh, the ambition is that they should ensure this uh, interdisciplinary training of the students, uh, but in close collaboration with the, with the stakeholders. Yes, next please. So here we see the 15 different PhD project in, in this phosphorus landscape. Just very, very briefly, uh, some of the focus areas, we will look into how we capture P in different environments, but also how we can recover it, how phosphorus can be utilized uh, in agriculture again, and more basic research on, on, uh, uh, on phosphorus cycling in different systems. And all of this should be in, in the context of, of social science. So, so hopefully we can identify uh, potential barriers or enablers for, uh, for phosphorus sustainability in, in the future. So this was a, a very, very brief introduction. Uh, we just had our kickoff meeting in March this year. And at the moment we are in the recruitment process. Uh, so we expect to have, have 15 PhD recruited by, by late autumn this year. So I look forward to come back to this uh, project uh, in the coming years. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe just a question. So you're currently recruiting PhDs. So yes. it's that. And it's, it? there's there's a few positions still open, but it's 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 uh, closing soon. But there are open positions still, and and we have the yeah. You can see the link on on the web page, and I think Ludwig also shared a, a link uh, in the in the general session earlier. Okay, yeah. great. Hmm? Thank you very much. Um, okay. The next presentation is the Refocus project in the UK and Shane Rothwell from Lancaster University. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so my name's uh, Shane Rothwell from Lancaster University. Uh, I'm working on a project called Refocus, or to give it its full name, the role of phosphorus in the resilience and sustainability of the UK food system. Uh, it's funded under the uh, Global Food Security Resilience of the UK Food System uh, call. And it's a collaboration between Lancaster University, University of Leeds, AFI Northern Ireland, UTS in Sydney, CH and the NA Agri-Food uh, programme. Uh, essentially, we're wanting to understand um, the dynamics of phosphorus in the UK food system. We're doing that at different scales. So we're doing it at the UK scale, at regional scale um, and at um, catchment scale. And within that, we want to understand um, the resilience of catchments to uh, phosphorus uh, pressure and also maybe come up with some measures of sustainability and resilience as well at, at different scales. So next slide, please. So just to give you a, a very brief case study of a piece of work that we have done, uh, this was on our regional pieces of work uh, looking at the Northern Ireland food system. It really was an exercise in stakeholder engagement. So the first stage was to under, undertake a, a substance flow analysis or SFA uh, for phosphorus in the Northern Ireland food system. And there are historic problems with water quality and phosphorus in Northern Ireland. Um, it is a very 
livestock dominated food system. So manure is one of the key drivers of, of, of pollution and phosphorus inefficiency in that feed, food system, but uh, not, a lot of, not a lot of really positive action. So what this piece of work did and what particularly the SFA did, it brought all the relevant stakeholders together uh, on, in, in, a, in a common understanding of what the issue was and what, what might be done. Uh, so the outcomes of this were an academic paper, <coughs> uh, a, a stakeholder workshop where we presented the SFA and um, some scenarios built around the SFA for how alternative futures might look for Northern Ireland, which culminated in a technical report. I've put a couple of links there for the technical report and also a YouTube video highlighting uh, our stakeholder engagement in Northern Ireland. So that's just a brief example of one of the pieces of work we've done. So next slide, please. Thank you. And this is uh, just our other project output. So we are doing, as I mentioned before, a very specific piece of work about the buffering capacity of catchments. So why do some catchments leak phosphorus or some other cap capacity to absorb phosphorus? We're doing catchments, catchment phosphorus balances. We're running a trial to assess the legacy P potential. So the historic input of P uh, that's built up in the soil. We're, we're, we're testing our catchment soils to see if that might be agronomically relevant. We've done a piece of work looking at adaptive capacity, so it's a piece of social science, the adaptive capacity of our stakeholders in the catchments. We're doing regional phosphorus balances, and I've just completed uh, a new phosphorus SFA for the UK food system that will be published soon. And we are just this summer about to undertake a vulnerability assessment as well for the UK food system. That's going to be done uh, by our partners in, in, in Sydney. Uh, if you want to find out more about the project and our outputs, I've put a link to our website there. So that's just a very quick introduction to the to the Refocus project. So thank you. Thank you very much. I will be, I will ask later how you, how we can make the link between your very um, overall approach to, to, to catchments to the the JRC approach, which is think of a number, <laughs> which is the number for the threshold. And obviously in the end for policy, you do have to come up with a number um, because that's how regulation works. Um, so how do we how do we get from this very global approach to a, to a catchment to the actual number that is the threshold for phosphorus and and conceivably nitrogen losses. So that's maybe something to think about. Um, I'd like to move on to the next presentation, which is Elsie Buneman um, presenting the RELAX project, which is improving nutrient inputs for organic agriculture. Yes, hello everybody. I'm actually presenting the Lex for Bio project first. <laughs> Here I'm replacing Kari Ilivainio from Luke Finland, who is the coordinator, but who's actually chairing another session, parallel session. Um, so the Legs for Bio project um, aims to optimize the use of bio-based fertilizers in agriculture. And the overall aim is really to provide a good knowledge basis for future policies. And the project has 20 partners from 14 countries. It started in 2019. Um, originally, it was planned for four years, but then Corona struck and <laughs> we had to prolong it for one year because all the field trials were um, had to postpone for one year. But uh, you can move on. Next slide. Um, basically, we have identified um, quite a large selection now of, of nitrogen as well as phosphorus um, fertilizers that we are screening. Um, in the three work packages, three, four, and five, you can see there in, in pink, <laughs> um, where we're screening the agronomic performance as well as the risks related to these different um, bio-based fertilizers. And we have really tried to cover all um, relevant product function categories and, and also um, CMCs, so to really cover the whole um, range of, of different types of fertilizers. Um, in other work packages, we're also looking at the general characteristics. So that's that's work package two, general effects of these bio-based fertilizers on soil quality functioning. But the focus is very much on the agronomic assessment as well as the risk assessment. Um, there's also a work package on um, just quantifying the, the nutrient-rich side streams. That's in work package one. 
and looking at the obstacles um, for the use of these waste streams as, as bio-based fertilizers. And of course, then there's also um, assessments of the ecological impacts, um, socioeconomic aspects and, and policy. And um, yes, I think you can move on. So what I'm mostly involved in, in myself is um, the research uh, activities um, more on an agronomic um, perspective. Um, here's an example from work package three um, on phosphorus, where um, we are conducting field trials and uh, pot experiments in different countries across um, Europe. And the, there's also an evaluation of uh, compliance tests, how to test the fertilizers, how to predict the agronomic efficiency. Then there is the idea of, of um, extrapolating uh, the requirements of pea fertilizers in the U EU, um, where we're also aiming to use um, some of the Lucas soil data and, and soil samples um, to really estimate the current bioavailable phosphorus content in agricultural soils. Um, and the, the actual demand, um, and we're also looking at the phosphorus losses. Um, and as I said, the overall aim is then to, to really have a good knowledge base to, to make good policies. So yeah, the question of how to translate it then into <laughs> policies is also relevant for this project. And then I will just continue with the next one, the RELAX project. Um, so I'm based at, at FIBO, the Research Institute of Organic Agriculture in Switzerland. And this RELAX project is also co coordinated by FIBO, by Lucius Tan. And the aim of the RELAX project is to improve inputs for organic farming. So what is meant here is not only nutrient inputs, but it's also in, inputs into animal production, plant protection and so on. But what I will present here is only work package three. So the idea is to replace con so-called contentious fertilizers in organic farming. Um, well, that's sort of um, all manures originating from conventional farming. It can also be rock phosphate. It can also be some of the commercial fertilizers that originate from, um, let's say, organic uh, conventional um, mass production of, of animals, for example. And this here, we are um, a, a small team um, with University of Hohenheim and University of Copenhagen um, and FIBO. This is the core team. And then we have some organic farmer associations sort of as, as the wider team in, in work package three. Go on, please. So our objectives initially, we started in 2018. The, the, our aim was to document the current use of external nutrient inputs in organic farming in uh, five or actually we did se seven European countries in the end and also the, the actual needs for external inputs and then we went on to evaluate different technologies to recycle nutrients um, uh, for different aspects but always in relation to suitability um, for organic farming and in a third task we are developing a planning tool um, to match the regional nutrient demand with the um, uh, the available nutrient sources and um, in the end now towards the end of the project um, which will end April next year we are also deriving an overall evaluation and recommendation of recycling technologies that are acceptable for organic agriculture. Next slide please. Some key results, um, some have been published already, I forgot to put the reference but there's one paper in nutrient cycling and agroecosystems which came out last year by Reimer et al., um, which showed very clearly that if, if farms are um, uh, relying to a high degree on biological nitrogen fixation, so organic farms, then there is a tendency or, or a clear trend that phosphorus and potassium budgets um, tend to be more negative um, because then organic farmers do not actually use any inputs at all, typically. Um, here in the graph, you see the, 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 the countries that we were looking at more in depth, and you can also see the spread of uh, overall farm gate phosphorus budgets. So we found many organic farms with negative um, budgets for phosphorus and potassium. And what we also saw is that this high reliance on biological nitrogen uh, fixation actually was correlated typically also with low nitrogen outputs of the farms. 
Um, so based on this assessment, we can clearly state that there is a need for organic farms to increase the use of external inputs. And we propose that recycled fertilizers should really be used to, to fill this nutrient gap. And um, there is a PhD in a thesis involved in this work package also, which is doing a lot of modeling now to assess the effects of, uh, on soil quality based on some long-term experiments. Um, in March and April, we organized a webinar to gather the knowledge on organic contaminants and discuss with the stakeholders. And we are now transforming this into a synthesis paper. And as I said, this planning tool, the development is ongoing. And I think um, there's really a niche here that we are looking at a regional planning tool, not for individual farms, but on a regional basis. Um, and I think it's quite important also with in view of the um, EU goal of, of increasing the area under organic agriculture to 25%. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd now like to open before we, we we've had five of 10 projects. So I suggest that if anyone has any questions to the five projects so far, we can maybe open to those questions and have a little discussion about those five projects before we move on. Otherwise we'll have forgotten what they are by the time we get to the end of the 10. So is there anyone who has um, questions on the, the different projects so far? If so, just open your mic and speak or... Nope. Well, I, I would have a question regarding the, the threshold values for the um, aquatic bodies. I think that was the very first project. Yep. Go ahead, um, yes. How well can you generalize this, really, these threshold values? Are, how, um, or are they pretty unique for, for different um, pedoclimatic conditions, um, cl yeah, climatic conditions in particular? Okay, I can, I can answer. Yes, this is the problem, but we have established types, shared types, broad types. So idea is if the if the is a for example, if lake is similar, similar uh, characteristics, if lake has similar characteristics in neighbor countries, similar depths and alkalinity and uh, area, we could expect that also phosphorus thresholds should be similar in these lakes. Of course, there are many different uh, aspects. For example, also sampling, sampling strategy is important. And it's, it's very different. It can be very different between countries. Sampling depths, do, they, do, do you sample epilimnion or the whole, uh, whole water column or whole year or only summer and so on? However, I think that this is why we established ranges. You cannot say it's a 20 micrograms. But if we can say it's from 20 to 40 for this water, or from 20 to 30 for this lake type, this already could be reasonable. But, but, not, but not, for example, 150 <laughs> like this. And, but this is why I, I wanted to say that this is the responsibility of member states to set phosphorus objectives which ensure good ecological status. But what our project do, we can provide some guide what could be the right approaches, how to set them, and which could be these ranges for your orientation. You can check whether your threshold for this water body type is in this range for this water body type. Or so it, it can give you signs that you are on the right track. And of course, also we have a lot of transboundary, transboundary rivers, transboundary lakes, shared river, ba river basins. And for this is very important that this uh, phosphorus objectives are comparable because if, imagine if you have a transboundary lake and if in different countries sharing this lake have different objectives, <laughs> it will it will not give you good good results. Okay, okay. thank you. Any other comments? So I I had a question to um, Shane for refocuses. Effectively, do you see a link between your your work on catchment phosphorus and the the th final thresholds that are set for the phosphorus in the river. Um, it, it, short answer: No, I don't think. No, I mean I, I think um, set, setting the the, um, the biological 
thresholds is, is not is not really uh, where we're at. I suppose what we're more focused on is, is how do we get there. Uh, that that that's the key answer. So, um, and there's two. I mean, I can expand. I can just expand on that briefly if that's you know if, if that if that's of interest. Um, a couple of approaches about the catchment scale. One is if we can try to understand uh, what are the, the the key sources of P in in the water. So it's something called C, CQ analysis. So it's basically it's essentially just the relationship between uh, flow and P concentration. It can just tell us something about what are the uh, uh, likely main sources so is, is is pollution in that catchment is it um is it point source driven is it diffuse source driven or a or a combination of the two so first of all understanding where the p is coming from and then the the, the, the second thing is about this this concept of uh, catchment buffering capacity so what is it about what are the the, the physical chemical human uh, landscape characteristics of that catchment that mean phosphorus is or is not arriving in the water course and we know, you know different catchments have hugely different capacities to absorb the anthropogenic pea that's going in some of them are, some of them are really leaky so if we can identify what those characteristics are maybe some of them are manageable so if we can identify where the pea is coming from and can we enhance the buffering capacity of that catchment combined with uh, monitoring then Hopefully that those things combined can help us push us in the right direction of, of the uh, of the appropriate thresholds. Yeah, and I, and I think that is becoming increasingly visibly important because we're seeing that the objectives under the water framework directive are kind of unachievable with agriculture as it is at the moment. Um, so the yeah. Um, and, and simply reducing fertilizer use, fertilizers in the including everything manure, is a nice idea, but then it will reduce food production. Um, and that is clearly not acceptable at a long term. I mean, it may be locally acceptable in some specific target regions. Yeah. So, so finding some solutions that involve catchment management and where you can, how you can manage the soil, and the catchment and the landscape is clearly something which is going to require more work in the future. Yeah, I, I think that, that's another aspect of the of the catchment buffering capacity concept as well. Is um, you know if you have a really poorly buffered catchment that is suffering from water quality issues, you know there is the question: is is this an appropriate area to be farming in the current situation? Or if you have a highly buffered catchment, there's you know the opportunity to use that landscape for more intensive agriculture um you know it's it's um a, a hopefully you know guiding appropriate land use for that catchment if that if that makes sense and how does that fit in with the approach that we're taking to recycled fertilizers where we seem to be just looking at them on a generic scale in a generic catchment or am i <laughs> yeah i mean maybe elsa also you have ideas on that yeah because because there is work ongoing on how recycled fertilizers impact loss of phosphorus from soil yes i mean we are assessing in in the lex for bio we are assessing the 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 potential basically potential um phosphorus lossing by leaching uh, from a range of, of recycled fertilizers, um, but I mean, generally, my my um, perception would be that there is not not any principal difference. <laughs> I don't think that's a big it's a big problem <laughs> that that phosphorus losses would be um, higher, rather rather smaller to be uh, because I mean, in most recycled fertilizers, we do not have water soluble. P, but but other forms. Okay. Are there any other questions? If not, I suggest we move on to the next project. Okay. So, Janafis or Face, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it. I apologise. Um, from RWTH Arken, talking about metabolic engineering of Saccharomyces. <laughs> 
Right. Hello, everyone. So um, I would I would like to give you a brief overview over um, the poly production um, using baker seas and um, by, for the recycling of phosphorus. So next, please. So um, biotechnological polyphosphate production. Therefore, um, different steps are necessary. So the first step is called polyphosphate hyperaccumulation. Hyper um, this includes one step of phos phosphate starvation and one step of phosphate um, feeding of the Saccharomyces cerisea. So, and for the feeding step, you can use different kinds of phosphate sources. So, for example, the normal pure phos chemical phosphate, but you can also use um, phosphate rich plant extracts or phosphate rich wash waters from the industry. So, and the yeast will take up this phosphate and will produce polyphosphate. So you get polyphosphate rich yeast and this polyphosphate you can extract or you can produce um, a polyphosphate rich yeast extract and both products. So the pure polyphosphate and the yeast extract you can use in different applications. So for example, in um, the food industry or also in other technical applications. So, and on the right side, you can see different steps of this hyperaccumulation. Uh, these are uh, electron microscopy pictures. And it is really interesting to see that the vacuole, which is the main area in this yeast for the production of polyphosphate, so that the structure of the vacuole changes during the so from the starvation step to the feeding step, the vacuole will be more, is more enlarged at, a, um, at fat cells and um, it's clearly visible and full of polyphosphate. Um, we have enveloped in our, um, developed in our um, institute also um, analytics for the determination of the total amount of polyphosphate and also for the determination of the chain length of these polyphosphates. So up to now, we can produce polyphosphate in a cell content of 28% of cell dry weight with a chain length of um, yeah, around about 30 phosphate subunits. And we want to improve this complete method, this complete uh, process by metabolic engineering um, to get a better content and longer chain length. And we want to do that um, by the deletion of special phosphatases which cleave the polyphosphate and by the YOVA expression of enzymes which are um, have a main role in this polyphosphate metabolism. Next, please. So um, then I want to thank you for your attention and yeah. Thank you very much. So it's it's actually rather like producing foie gras with um <laughs> with ducks and geese. <laughs> it's kind of force feeding. <laughs> But it's also actually very similar to the process in biological wastewater treatment. Is that where the idea came from? Um, yes, this is based on, on this idea too. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. The next project is Jessica Rossi of Prosuma, which is integrating industrial methodology to unlock the implementation of phosphorus recovery. Good morning, I'm Jessica Rossi from the University of Bologna and uh, today I want to think with you about a question. Why is uh, the full-scale implementation of phosphorus recovery technologies not widespread? I mean, we are a group of experts uh, about phosphorus, usually more than me, uh, talking about uh, more complex topics uh, than these questions. 
But uh, uh, if uh, we ask to plant managers about uh, phosphorus management, at least in Italy, they uh, typically respond. Phosphorus? What is phosphorus? I don't use phosphorus in my plant. It is dangerous. Or, uh, oh, phosphorus, what a hassle. So only few um, plant managers see uh, the phosphorus recovery as an opportunity. Why? What's missing? Next, please. Our answer is uh, quantitative information, data able to support the companies uh, in the decision-making process about phosphorus recovery from their waste. So to overcome these barriers, the presumer project developed an uh, industry-oriented methodology uh, able to provide all the necessary quantitative information and uh, indicators to guide the companies in the assessment of environmental, economic and social impacts of the potential phosphorus recovery from uh, their waste. Uh, the, the main novelty of uh, this uh, methodology is uh, the second step, that is uh, the assessment of phosphorus flows at firm level through an uh, uh, innovative visualization tool. We applied this methodology to an Italian company, Pizzoli, the only that have uh, already installed a um, phosphorus recovery technology from its uh, wastewater. And uh, we were able to say to the plant manager then that uh, only uh, less than half of the phosphorus that enters in uh, its, its process is uh, really uh, exploited. Uh, second, the economic feasibility of uh, his investment uh, is not ensured. And uh, finally, uh, he surely comply uh, with the Italian legislation. Uh, it is obvious, not enough. However, uh, now he has all the necessary information to improve their strategies about phosphorus recovery in his company. Next, please. So our approach is a bottom-up approach that starts from the industrial needs since we think that the industries has the real potential to increase phosphorus recovery. Uh, if you want to uh, deeply analyze our, our approach, you can re refer to these two publications or surely contact uh, AGS. Thank you. Thank you. So, so just to clarify, you're effectively talking about food industry plants mainly? Food yes. Processing? Yeah. Yes. And, and uh, the application of the methodology uh, in uh, Pizzoli, uh, Pizzoli is a food company. Okay. And, and do you have contacts with food companies elsewhere in Europe? Are you looking for that? Is there a potential to either now or later um, extend your methodology to other companies elsewhere? Uh, yes, it's, it's, um, the methodology uh, can surely use also in uh, multi utilities uh, and uh, about, um, also in other uh, industrial sectors, um, not only for phosphorus recovery, for example. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to Joris de Bacca, NutriFlow, University of Antwerp, talking about mapping nitrogen and phosphorus and protein flows in Flanders. So again, a regional approach. Indeed, thank you very much. Uh, so we're executing a material flow analysis study. Uh, we're doing this indeed in the region of Flanders. This is a study commissioned by the Flemish government, uh, which is a region in, in Belgium, of course. Uh, we're studying phosphorus flows, but next to that also nitrogen and protein flows, which is quite a, a novel approach, really. Um, our focus is completely on the food production chain. So you see here on the slides uh, some of the most important parent nodes or processes that we uh, uh, that we look at in our study, but um, it is a study with a quite high resolution. So these nodes are still uh, split up in in different sub processes, so we can have a good view on on all the different uh, processes. 
the goal of this study is yeah, to identify hotspots of uh, losses of these uh, nutrients. Uh, for protein, it's uh, it's also yeah to check uh, how is our region in Flanders uh, how is it performing in terms of uh, protein uh, generation or destruction, let's say, um, and then to identify also opportunities to improve uh, efficiency throughout uh, the whole system uh, in Flanders. Um, it's more or less well to a certain extent a repetition of a study that has been done already for the reference year of two thousand nine. Uh, we are doing a reference year 2018, uh, so we will also be able to uh, do some trending there. Um, the consortium that is executing the study, it's pulled by the Ghent University. I am from the University of Antwerp, and then there's also the European Biogas uh, Association and United Experts uh, consulting firm who is uh, involved. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our involvement from the University of Antwerp is mostly in the work package that does the, the modeling and the indicator calculation. Uh, and in the frame of this modeling, in the frame of this study, um, but it will also extend beyond the study, we are actually building our own custom um, material flow analysis tool. Uh, so we're doing this in the Python ecosystem. And we see this as an open source initiative, uh, so we can share with uh, the community our sources and hopefully in the future uh, collaborate uh, and improve on the tool with the input of, of others. Um, one of the advantages that we see is we put our data of our flows and processes in, an, in a structured SQL database, uh, which means that we don't really have to aggregate a lot of the, the data. We can do our indicator calculation very close to our uh, source data. So we try to be uh, with our tool, some sort of a one-stop shop um, for the different elements that you do in these uh, studies, uh, indicator calculation and also visualization. Uh, one of the things that we're also building in there is a link to other databases, um, like for example, uh, food, uh, foodstuff databases. So if you have a material, you can link it to material in such a database and then pull in data or properties from that material uh, from those other DBs. Um, for example, a nitrogen or a phosphorus concentration. Uh, so you don't have to look it up uh, yourself, but you can just pull it in via the tool. Uh, that's a little bit the idea behind it. Um, by using the Python uh, ecosystem for this, we can also build and and you uh, will build upon and use uh, things that have been developed by other uh, developers, other scientists, um, like for example, the visualization that's Sankey spider that you see there in the uh, left lower corner. Um, it's a library created by uh, Lupton and colleagues from um, uh, uh, British University, I forgot which one, sorry. Um, and we are also building in this library and using it, reusing it in, in our own system to, to create these nice Sankeys, but also other libraries uh, that are there for uh, our um, data reconciliation and things like this, uh, we, can, we can build upon and use. So if you have, of course, if you have questions uh, about this or you want to know more, uh, feel free to either now <laughs> ask your questions or, uh, or reach out to, to me later. Thank you. Thank you very much. There may well be questions because there are other projects, I think, here who are also using um, systems to develop phosphorus flow models. So why one system, why another, why develop a new system? <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next project, which is Marcela Fernandos de Souza and the Grass to Algae project. Um, thank you. So good morning. My name is Marcela Souza and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Ghent University. And one of the questions that I'm working on now is can nutrients from grass be used for growing algae? And that is exactly what the Grass to Algae project is investigating. So uh, it's an operational group uh, for one year, so it's only running for this year. And it's financed by the Flemish Department of Agricultural and Fisheries. And it aims at improving the circularity of farms by creating value from grass that is currently seen as waste. So uh, what kind of grass is seen as a waste by a farmer? Well, in the last years, herbicides cannot be used anymore to maintain the edges of the fields clean. 
So grass is now freely growing next to fields as illustrated in the slide. And farters, farmers need to mow this grass to keep it under control. And this mowed grass is currently seen as waste. And in order to transform this grass into a resource, uh, grass to algae focuses on the fraction that's rich in easy, easily available nutrients, which is the grass juice. And this juice is produced by pressing the grass. And uh, it can be used for producing protein-rich algae for several applications, for instance, feeding animals, and could possibly receive a green label and be utilized as an organic food. However, there are some challenges in this process. Uh, the fresh juice is very dark and algae needs light to grow. Also, the juice has its own community of fungi, yeast, and bacteria, which the algae need to outcompete for the nutrients. So uh, we're currently testing different treatments to make the grass juice a good nutrient source for the algae to grow happy and healthy. And finally, to make this a truly circular process, we also need to propose uses for the fiber fraction, which results from the pressing of the grass juice. So this can be an aerobic digestion for energy production or also using the fibers for making biomaterials. And this way, by using both the grass juice and the fibers, we can use the entire biomass, reduce the generation of waste, and improve both the circularity and the business case of a farm. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Why can't you just, um, just, why can't you feed <laughs> the grass to, to local cows as silage or hay or whatever? Ah, yeah, you, you can as well. The problem with this grass specifically, since it's the, in the edges of the fields, you don't have really control of its composition. So it's not something that was sown. So it, it can be that the, there are some toxic plants there that will actually kill your cattle. So it's safer to have a, a processing step to uh, yeah, enable this use. Okay, right. Now that that explains that explains <laughs> that. Um, so the last project presentation is Petri Ekholm, the Finnish Environmental Institute, on the Gypsum Initiative. Your microphone is disactivated. Sorry. So my name is Petri Ekholm, and I work at the Finnish Environment Institute. I'm going to briefly tell you about the project Gypsum Initiative, where we try to disseminate information about Gypsum Amendment of Agricultural Fields. And the final aim is to save the Baltic Sea. So what is Gypsum? Gypsum is calcium sulfate and it comes from different varieties. We have used mainly phosphor gypsum, but there is also flue gas, desulfurization gypsum, mineable natural gypsum, and perhaps also recycled gypsum. And whatever gypsum you use, of course, it has to be free from of harmful substances and excess phosphorus. So how it works? There's been a lot of work on gypsum and the mechanism is rather well known. According to Finnish experience, when you apply gypsum, you immediately can cut down the losses of total suspended solids and phosphorus by half. And as a bonus effect, you also dissolve organic carbon and also particulate organic carbon losses from fields to surface waters are reduced. We don't know exactly how long the effect lasts, but it's somewhere around four to five, uh, sorry, three to five years. And this gypsum doesn't cure the primary cause of agricultural pollution, but it could be seen as a trans transitory method which gives time for slower measures to work, for example, in decreasing legacy phosphorus. The good thing in gypsum is that it can be applied to large field areas, mainly to clay, clay soils, but it may work also in coarse, coarse mineral soils. But you cannot use gypsum very much in lake catchments to avoid so-called sulfate-mediated eutrophication. 
according to our knowledge, gypsum has, doesn't have any major agricultural restrictions. And according to our modeling efforts, we could, with only this single measure, we could reduce the load coming from Finland and entering the Baltic Sea by about 15%. The national aim is now to amend about 50,000 hectares with gypsum till the year 2022, focusing on the most problematic areas. And this is in addition to the 6,000 hectares which have already been amended in pilot projects. But there's lots of lots of ultimate potential in Finland and gypsum initiative is about how much there could be in other countries. Next slides, please. Well, when you add gypsum on top of field, it's quite easily dissolved in soil solution, which increases the calcium and sulfate concentration and thereby increases the ionic strength of soil solution. It then uh, makes electrical double layer around clay particles thinner, which allows particles to come closer each other. It causes some kind of micro aggregation, which makes the soil less prone to erosion, which means less suspended solids and less particulate phosphorus to water. In addition, phosphorus and also organic carbon will be, the losses will be reduced phosphorus still being available to plants. And unlike agricultural lime, gypsum doesn't affect soil pH. And the final slide, please. One word, one picture is word of thousand words. Here you can see our one of our pilot areas and a lorry carry, transporting the gypsum to farm, the gypsum heap, and how the gypsum is then spread on soil and how it looks after spreading. And then you see a miraculously clear puddle on a clayey soil. Usually in Finland, at least, clayey soils cause very turbid runoff. But here the water is very, very clear after the gypsum treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions to the five second part projects then? Or indeed to other projects? No, you're all very quiet. <laughs> if not, I had a question maybe to Elsa and also to um, Joris about regional approaches. So you can come up with a regional model or a regional approach, but how do you move from this kind of regional concept to farmer uptake? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, because, because uh, I mean, you, you come up with a nice regional answer and you tell farmers that it would be a nice idea in your region to do something. Um, what yes. is the incentive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, our idea with the regional approach um, in the first instance is more, um, I mean, on the one side to make um, regional farmer associations, organic farmer associations aware um, of the potential lack or, or imbalance of, of nutrients in their region for organic farming. Um, and we expect that they would then realize, well, if we would have um, a few more biogas plants, for example, <laughs> that would be really useful for organic farming. Then we could use the, the digestates and that would give us a, a good balance of, of um, macronutrients, for example. And I think with this quite specific um, um, target group, um, once the, the farmer associations would be aware, then, then this would quite easily translate also to farmers. Um, but our idea was there's, there are many, many tools to, for a good nutrient budgeting or, or planning um, on a farm, but there is much less on a regional level. That was our idea, yeah. 
But mm. of course, it's, it's a valid question. Um, I mean, I, yeah, speaking for organic farming, I guess my, my feeling really is if you get the organic farmer associations on board, then you have um, won the, the game half, half at least. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, so effectively going through the, um, the advisory system for agriculture, which is right. maybe more effective in organic farming than it is in conventional farming. Mm -hmm. In that there's a more direct link. Okay, mm -hmm. um, Joris, maybe. Yeah, uh, I think for, uh, if I can speak for the Flemish region, the emphasis of our study is a little bit less on the farming aspects and maybe on uh, uh, more other flows. One of the difficulties that I see uh, in uh, legislators and, and um, yeah, government bodies is that it's very fragmented. So we're doing the study. Uh, when we started it, uh, it, was in, um, it was commissioned by the Flemish Environment Agency, but we're now, I think, six months later, and they shifted around responsibilities, and we now are actually commissioned by another government body. So I see there one of the difficulties is that everything's very fragmented, uh, and there's other reports that are being made for um, nutrient balances, on a more farming uh, level. And we also, of course, we use those reports in our study uh, because we need those flows. Um, but yeah, because of this fragmentation, I think our study will, will lead to, um, will come on, on the, the desk maybe of a different minister, not responsible for agriculture, but more uh, environments. And I think there is, there is a lot of work to do there, uh, to be honest, uh, to, to, to uh, make it a more, a concerted uh, approach between different governmental bodies. Okay, thanks. I see Shane's hand is raised. If others wish to say something, please raise your hand or put a comment in the discussion. Shane? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, j um, just a follow on comment on the uh, concept of the regional analysis. Um, and this is, this is something we've come across uh, continuing with, with refocus. and. It is, it is a, a question of looking at these things at the appropriate scale. So when you look at things at, at a national scale, so for example, the, 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 the UK uh, substance flow analysis we've, we've just done gives you one, one picture. Uh, when you start to look regionally, so the, this slide has just come up perfect now, so you can see the nuts, ones, regions, particularly in the UK, regionally, the agriculture is very, very different. So for example, in the Northwest, it's a very livestock dominated region with its own specific challenges. Uh, the East uh, is a very arable dominated system. And again, with, with, with different issues and different challenges. So I think the question of scale and regionality is really important. If you want to, you know, there's, there's regionally specific problems. And then because of that regionally specific answers uh, and its specific farming communities. So in the Northwest, it's very much the, uh, the, the dairy industry uh, that, that's one of the key drivers behind um, um, uh, phosphorus um, surplus and, and water quality issues uh, in, in, the, in the West Midlands. Uh, it's increasingly becoming the, pol the, the, the poultry industry uh, over in the East. Um, to be fair, I mean, the Arab, arable sector is pre pretty good um, overall now in the UK, but over in the East, it's more you know, fertilizer use and, and, and soil loss. So I think, you know, it, it, just holding on to this this question of scale, uh, and then that allows you to address address the right audience uh, within that region. Yeah. So effectively, the regionalisation allows you to identify which is the farming community, the farming sector that you should be talking to about specific problems in a specific region. That that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Okay. I yeah. see. I see Jessica's hand raised. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, um, we have the same problem, that uh, is uh, the, the lack of data, mm, both at the bottom level, so industries, uh, any kind of industries and uh, uh, the macro level, regional countries. So surely uh, our methodology 
can be easily extended to the entire supply chain. So we can use uh, it uh, for, for the industries, uh, for uh, fertilizer product, pro producers and uh, um, also farmers. But uh, um, I think that the challenge is uh, to uh, link uh, the two scales, uh, micro scales and macro scales because uh, uh, several uh, indicators uh, exist to measure the two scales, but uh, if uh, we uh, use a top-down approach, um, force, um, forcing uh, um, the micro level to use macro scale indicators, they cannot uh, evaluate uh, them. And on the, uh, on the contrary, uh, the, the macro scale is not uh, able to use uh, uh, micro scale indicators to set uh, targets, uh, thresholds, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, define uh, policies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Joris, your hand is still raised by accident or deliberately? No, 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 I had a question. For, okay, go uh, ahead. Go yes, ahead. thank you. <laughs> I had a question for uh, Jessica for the prosumer project. Um, you, you mentioned gathering data from stake, well, the industry. Um, I was wondering, did you, how did you go about to gather those the data? Did you go via structured interviews with uh, uh, identified stakeholders or industry uh, people? Or how did you go about to do that? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Ah, okay. <laughs> to, to gather information from uh, the industry, so the food industry, uh, did you do this in a structured approach? Did you uh, have uh, like interviews uh, and did you okay. select uh, a number of people or how did you gather your, your data to, to see what... Uh... Okay, uh, okay. Uh, in the, um, particularly in, uh, in phosphorus uh, recovery uh, topic, uh, in Pizzoli, uh, the company uh, that uh, we analyzed, um, fortunately, data are um, were uh, already available because uh, it uh, is a very structured companies company. But we uh, also try to upload uh, the same methodology to the two diary companies, uh, always in Italy. And uh, in this case, we uh, needed to um, um, apply some tests and analysis on wastewater in different points of the processes. Uh, in general, uh, collecting data from industry is, is uh, very difficult. Also in other sectors, for, for example, for plastics or textile sectors, uh, companies uh, don't doesn't don't have uh, this uh, this kind of information about uh, sustainability or uh, mm -hmm. it, it is a it is a, a challenge. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? If not, I would like to move on to an open discussion. No, okay. So in the chat, the discussion, you will find a link to a thing called Jamboard. And what I would like you to do is open that link on your computer. Um, let me know in the discussion, stay, stay connected to Zoom, don't disconnect Zoom, but click on the link to Jamboard. And then I would like you to each put a post-it which is the fourth button down in the menu on the left in Jamboard, as to what area you think research is needed on nutrients today. So let me know via the discussion if you succeeded in opening Jamboard. It works for me, so hopefully it will work for you. Cool. 
So when you've opened Jamboard, there's a kind of whiteboard. And on the left of the whiteboard, there are a number of little buttons. There's a pen and a rubber and an arrow. And then a thing which in French says pense bet, but in English maybe says post it and something else in your own local language. So it's the fourth one down. If you click on that, it will open a window in which you can write on the yellow. And what I'd like you to write is your idea for where further research is needed on nutrients in coming years. And then you simply click on record or save and it will put that onto the whiteboard. And when we have a number of suggestions, we can discuss them, see if they fit together, move them about. So I'm waiting for the first idea. Yes, I see an idea. Cool. And we can make them a bit bigger so they're actually legible for people whose screens. If you keep it down to about 10 to 15 words, which is probably difficult, <laughs> we can fit more on the screen. <laughs> Excellent. The ideas are coming in. Are the people who are still unable to connect? If so, send me a message in the discussion and we'll try and I'll send a message to everyone in the discussion if you can't connect to Jamboard and we'll try and sort it out for you. Oh, someone's made a brown one. That's cool. I didn't know you could change the color. So I'm just waiting a moment while people put on their ideas and then we'll try and group them. So long-term field experiments, the bioavailability of recovered nutrients. So to some extent, I'll put that with manure management because it kind of fits together. How to use recalcitrant residual nutrients. So that's kind of legacy phosphorus. So I've lost Zoom. No, there's Zoom. Can people still hear me? Yes, I yeah. can hear you. Good. Okay. Um, right. So maybe the person who put manage nutrient release from organic wastes, can you say a couple of words about what you mean on that and what sort of research you think would be useful? Um, that was me. 
Okay. <laughs> Go well, ahead. I mean, I know it's an old question, but it's still Im very important to optimize the um, the synchrony of, of nutrient release. And I think we can still improve that by a better understanding of, of uh, boundary conditions, but also by, by knowing exactly um, what we are putting on, on the land. <laughs> So I think maybe that's that's one important aspect of, of just really implementing a, a, a fast characterization of, of any complex organic nutrient source that is put onto the fields of, so that we know exactly which amounts of, of nutrients are actually there. Okay, and the person who put the one about climate change, which I can't see anymore, there, this one. I don't know whether you can all see when I click on a, a post-it. The, the pink one, which I'm moving about. Yeah, um, that's, that's me. Uh, so sorry. Can, uh, oh, it's Geneviève. Hello. I don't know what, are you in Canada? No, I'm in Sweden. Oh, you're in Sweden. Okay. So it's not at a strange time of the night then. No, <laughs> uh, it's the correct time, the European time. Um, yeah. So I just think that uh, because it, there's so many interlinking issues, I'm weary of doing a lot of research that focuses on one thing, but rather how does this fit into, I think, N and climate are a little bit more advanced on actually interlinking with policy. And there are changes kind of happening at national and EU levels. And I think doing research on where are the synergies and trade-offs and just things we really need to be aware of and getting that into the policy arena would be really useful and likely get us somewhere faster than trying to make that same journey. Um, yeah. So it's very much related to convincing policymakers. I don't think it's just convincing policymakers, but being sure we have the evidence that can easily show us where there are conflicts and synergies. So if we go for this resource recovery option, can we still recover NNP or are we putting ourselves into a box? So I think, I think there is kind of an R&D component to this. And then there is kind of the more applied policy arena, right, and getting things on there. But the same thing with like even something like, okay, let's reduce meat consumption in France going and doing those things that's probably synergistic with everything. And we don't need to repeat all of this, but we can highlight that and see where there are key specific things that need to be brought in so that we don't end up in a negative place. So I think we have conceptually good ideas around this, but I don't think we have that much research on it. So I think there's still some great opportunities there for us. Yeah, okay. So, so finding some actual facts, not just concepts and models. And I think, yes, I mean, obviously the link to climate change in Europe is essential because the climate is kind of the, the big objective in the Green Deal. And it has um, to be. So I think it has we, to be. So I think <laughs> it has get to be. on board with that and, 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 and get into some good P options with those, those climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. Okay. So I'm kind of seeing two big groups here. One is about... Um, managing soil and nutrients and manures and so on. And the other is more about the recycled fertilizers. Obviously the two fit together. Um, the blue one, can the person who put this one give us a few words about what you see as needed in the relationship between phosphorus forms and eutrophication? Okay, this is Petri Ekholm from Finland. I was just thinking that the countries with, which have a lot of erosion and particulate phosphorus, um, they try to estimate how bioavailable is phosphorus in particulate form and how it relates to dissolved phosphorus. And I think that at least I don't have, perhaps nobody has the answer still, how available phosphorus bound to soil particles is in different kind of receiving waters. Okay, so we're still lacking information about how it actually works. To my understanding, yes. Yep. And in particular related to soil. So that maybe also fits well into the mission on soil health and, and the Horizon Europe work on that. Um, so I'm moving things about, uh, are there um, people who think I've moved their um, post-it to the wrong place or to the right place or who'd like to move it somewhere else? Um, 
I kind of see these two these two big areas of better understanding of how we use nutrients on farms and how that impacts eutrophication and then another area on promoting recycling and climate change is kind of somewhere in between i guess because it joins the two together yep i'm linking nutrient management and soil organic matter goes in between who whose post it is this green one the link nutrient management and soil okay. organic yeah that was me and it's, it's also cl um, closely related to genevieve's um posted on because it's related the carbon is related to the climate also um so i think we have to be aware of um yeah preserving the carbon also as much as possible in any recycling um attempts <laughs> Okay, um, so the, the post-it on the enhanced overview of biofertilizer demand, can the person who put that give us a few words as to what they see as useful there in terms of research? Does anybody admit it? <laughs> No. Uh, is there anyone who would like to, who's seen another post-it, which is not their own, which they think is important, which they would like to kind of emphasize? Yeah, maybe could someone who, who had the, the post-it on the risk assessment of the bio-based fertilizers say what they meant exactly? <laughs> uh, yes, yes I can. I can do, uh, Kimo van Dijk. Um, it's partly also related to the nice event that you organized, the RELAX uh, event. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit linked also to new sanitation. So uh, if we go to other systems, other products, for example, new bio-based fertilizer products, what I see here in the Netherlands that uh, it's quite unclear, for example, if you can use urine treated or not from human sources, for example. So in that case, there are risks involved, but that's in all challenges that we have, uh, but they are perceived in a different way because I think that the knowledge and the experience are not there from research, let's say. So policymakers need more research uh, information uh, to be better in uh yeah in, in in balancing those risks i would say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but there there are also other flows um uh not, not human flows but let's say uh, from the food industry that i think have the same issue and then it's mm -hmm. not the eu level legislation the regulation that is there uh, but especially because these flows are mostly local uh flows and probably also the products it's about national uh, legislation that is uh yeah, a little bit outdated and has to be updated also on that kind of flows and that mm -hmm. kind of new products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I guess in some ways it's related also to the consumer acceptance. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, and the food industry, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the regulators retail. are really, really afraid of, of uh, running into problems with, with consumer acceptance but, uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's it's really also important to, to raise um, the acceptance and and the knowledge on 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 how how we can produce food sustainably <laughs> yeah okay so someone put one on consumer acceptance yeah that was me <laughs> i was going to say was that you elsa okay <laughs> um what about using recalcitrant residual nutrients in soils um who was this that was me again. That's you again. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also an old question, but it's it's still an important one that we, um, in addition to closing nutrient cycles, we can also somehow improve the use of, of the P that we have put into the soil, P and other nutrients that we have put into the soils over decades. And transparent indicators to farmers to match management with regional water quality thresholds. Can yeah, hi, that's uh, that's just me. So, uh, can you just say who you are? 
Uh, Martin, I mean, we, yeah, we've got your name, but kind of what organization? <laughs> uh, Martin, I uh, studied at Wageningen University and uh, now working at the Nutrient Management Institute in uh, the Netherlands and mainly working on uh, phosphorus uh, flows and mainly between uh, agricultural uh, land and water systems. And in the Netherlands, what I see is that we use a lot of those phosphorus indicators for a soil test, but uh, most most of them are based uh, to steer on crop yield, and the ones which can be used to um, yeah manage uh, phosphorus inputs to uh, match regional water quality thresholds thresholds are mainly used in a resource context, and they do exist because we already developed them since the 1990s but they're not yet uh, implemented by, uh, by farmers. So it was, um, so, yeah, I would suggest that uh, in my research in the direction would be helpful because if farmers have the tool where they can transparently know, oh, this is now my impact on water quality, then it's also easier for them to understand if um, they need to uh, alter their management. But then, Farmers are maybe more interested in their crop yield than which brings them an economic benefit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th than in than in protecting water quality, which makes them intellectually satisfied <laughs> and, and get on better with their children, but doesn't actually pay the <laughs> pay the rent at the end. No, of the no, month. no. Um, so, so maybe also one of the tools is if we could actually develop indicators which clearly showed the impact on the water quality then you could give the farmers economic remuneration through a wonderfully revised modernized common agricultural policy <laughs> yeah and there are multiple ways where you can where you can achieve that because if you have regional if the, the goal is not like a single thing for every farm but you can have a regional plan where you uh, match uh, all those uh, targets combined to a certain ecological threshold and then uh, yeah, indeed have some kind of an economic uh, benefit for farmers which have to reduce a lot in their uh, productivity for sure yeah okay are there other people who've put a post-it who i haven't asked to talk who would like to defend their idea or are, are you all shy <laughs> Um, long, long-term field experiments. Who was it who suggested this? We can't hear you, bizarrely. You're... Try again. Uh, yeah, oh. sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if I, I I wrote it. I, I thought it, or I made notes about <laughs> it at least. But it, I, I could defend it because I think it's a very important uh, aspect. Uh, here in the Netherlands, you see that uh, for already decades, we don't have any uh, long-term big uh, field uh, experiments. Uh, in some other countries like Denmark and Switzerland, I think also that they have it. And here the discussion is coming back if we should invest in that related to new type of products, so bio-based fertilizers. Uh, but that whole infrastructure, as you could call it, and that whole knowledge, is now getting into a, a pension phase, let's say, if you talk about the, the people. Uh, uh, so that's, yeah, that's something that, uh, that's uh, under discussion here. And I think it's relevant. If you have new products, you need also long-term um, uh, research in the, the risks, the economic efficiency, etc. Yeah, yeah, and it is, it is obviously, I mean, we see today the valuable information we have from the long-term experiments using sewage sludges and composts and increasingly digestates. And so the question is what experiments and how to launch them today so that in 10 years time or 20 years time, we have the long-term yeah. data for other materials. Um, so, any other any other comments or 
I can I can say some words. To, <laughs> to go ahead, Sandra, yeah. yes. I, I just wanted again to stress the importance of setting nutrient targets, ecologically relevant nutrient targets for rivers and lakes, because all this work in the end is 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 focused on how to reduce nutrient loads to inland waters and coastal waters, and how to reduce nutrient concentrations. And how this work can be done if we don't know exactly, precisely, which are the nutrient thresholds which we want to reach. And uh, I also really like the idea about these um, uh, indicators for farmers, because I think this all this process should be more transparent. And I think also for farmers, they could be more interested in this uh, nutrient management if they would know that, for example, in our lake, we have phosphorus concentration this one, this, but to have our lake in good quality, which is also important for farmers, that our children can go to swim and we can go to, so on to use this for recreation and for fishing, phosphorus concentration should be this. And to reach this, we should do this, to reach this concentration, concentration, we should do this and that. So it could be more and more understandable, more transparent. But if we don't know what are these nutrient concentrations to, to have good status, everything else, how, how far we should reduce phosphorus. <laughs> so thanks. And, and that, that would seem to me to be something which should be clearly linked to the water framework um, directive. Yeah, it is. Local, actually, it, local management. Yeah, it is. Organizations. It is, but this is actually in, in the, in, under water framework directive, every country have to set nutrient objectives for water bodies. But this process maybe has not been so transparent and, and not, in, not in all cases linked to ecology, you know, which are the phosphorus concentrations which ensure that your lakes and rivers are in good status. And I think this information should be also much should be much more available also on internet. So you can go, for example, on internet and see for my river, for my lake, but what is the actual current nutrient concentration and which is ideal nutrient concentration? So it could be more initiative, more more uh, more interest also for for general public, for farmers. What we can do to 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 do this? If we can if we can have some numbers which is easily available and linked to actually to ecology, to, to good water quality, which I think that everybody is actually interested in. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other comments, questions? If not, I think we conclude. And we resume in the plenary at two o'clock where Kimo has the pleasure of summarizing what we've discussed <laughs> for us. <laughs> Um, and we will have the summaries of the, the other parallel sessions and then presentation from DG Research and then a final discussion. So join again at two o'clock, I assume with the main Zoom link that we had this morning. Thank you very much. Uh,